morning, everyone. It is good morning. It is so good to be here. I'm so excited to be here with you, and I feel honored to be up here speaking with you. My name is Marcy Worthy. I'm the director of Next Steps here. And um, if you're participating online, I'm so excited that you've turned, tuned in as well. Well, I'm also excited that it's a little bit cooler in here. I know it feels hot. Thank you for the fans. Who was here last week? Who was here? Oh, okay, it was the hottest service I'd ever been a part of. So if you're here, you weren't here last week, this is actually cool. So I'm excited about that. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you for a little rain. It feels kind of tropical. So I'm ready to get started this morning. Well, as you know, and as Brian mentioned, we're in the middle of a sermon series called The Best Yes, and it's all about how do we make wise decisions in this world that's competing for our attention, our resources, and our time. And we learned a couple weeks ago that wise decisions come from intimacy and obedience to God. And then last week, we learned that wise decisions require us to pray and to prioritize, to pre-decide, and to prune. And these are all important truths for bringing God into the center of our decision-making. And today, we're going to actually talk about the other side of decision-making, the side where we um, decide that it's important to decide to serve others. And what does that look like? How do we do that? Why is it important? And what does God's Word say about our time and resources in serving other people? So the title of today's message is Serving Sacrificially, in a world of self-care. Now that word self-care, it can almost be controversial in today's uh, day and age, and um, it can mean different things to different people. Some of you are sitting here going, what in the world is self-care? I don't even know what she's talking about. And others of you know very well um, what's happening in the world of self-care. So I'm gonna go ahead and offer two definitions just because it can mean different things to different people. So the first type of self-care that I want to talk about is God-honoring. God-honoring self-care. That's about protecting boundaries and doing things for ourselves that nurture our bodies and rejuvenate our souls. God-honoring self-care. It's about the importance of taking care of ourselves, the importance of exercising, the importance of eating healthy, of resting, of simplifying, of praying, taking a Sabbath, spending time with God, hanging out with our family and friends, reading a good book, just being outside in in creation, right? Whatever kind of fills your soul, that's so, so important. It's all about slowing down and making time for yourself so that you can be healthy emotionally and spiritually, mentally, uh, physically. Our whole body, our whole being is important to the Lord, and he's inviting us into this wholeness. Um, John Mark Comer wrote a book called The Ruthless Elimination of Hurry. Many of you have read it. If you haven't, it's a great word. It's a great book, not a word. It's a great book um, because he talks a lot about the importance of rest and intentional resistance to this culture of more, right? This, we have to be intentional in resisting the culture that tells us we always need more. God is actually inviting us into rest and telling us that we can stop striving It's this invitation that moves us from self-production to God presence, right? Instead of producing, it's it's the presence of the Lord. And as I was thinking about this, it's totally the Martha and Mary story, right? It's Martha, their sisters. Martha is, is producing, and she's working, and she's serving, and she's active. And Mary is choosing God's presence. And what does the Lord say? Mary chose better, right? Mary chose better. So it's so important that we slow down. And I believe um, in our times of rest and slowing down, our times of worship, that's when we can appreciate all that we have and we can actually start to hear the quiet voice of God. So there's a positive, God-honoring, healthy side of self-care, right? All about taking care of ourselves, resting, reading, um, anything that that, um, rejuvenates our soul, to care for ourselves, super, super important. But there's another side of self-care. This side of self-care is going like wildfire in our culture. Um, It's self-honoring, right? So the first one's God-honoring, this one's self-honoring. And this is how we can define it. Self-honoring self-care is the act of participating in activities and ways of thinking that prioritize you as an individual instead of those around you. Sometimes prioritizing you as an individual to the detriment of those around you. 
This excessive, this trendy self-care, it's like this huge cultural movement that has just taken off um, in my research, even in the last six years, where there's just so much about taking care of ourselves. It's exploding. And, and what it is, is it's kind of this movement that can be seen as putting self first, no matter the cost and no matter the, the consequences. The idea that like my, my needs and my way is most important. So whatever I have to do to make sure that I feel good, that I feel cared for, that I'm pampered, that I'm indulged, right? It's actually expected and encouraged and validated in our culture. It's starting to feel like normal. Well, this type of self-care, it's in vogue, but it's vague. What do I mean by that? I mean that self-care is, it can start to be including anything and everything that makes us feel good. It's about any activity or inactivity that makes me feel good. I can just chalk that up to self-care, right? This self-indulgent side of self-care can even be taken a step further as we see in social media. It can, it can be all about this relentless demonstration of privilege. Like, I'm taking such good care of myself. I've got these extravagant vacations, right? I'm buying $20 green juice. I'm, 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 I'm only in the best brands. I'm taking such good care of myself. I need to know that you need to know that I'm taking good care of myself, too. I'm going to post that and show that and live into that. And it can become this whole cycle of self-care, right, that can get out of control. Now, Enjoying nice things, there's nothing wrong with that. Um, God wants us to live and to enjoy life. It's, it's the heart, it's the state of our heart that God has a lot to say about. And that's what I wanna talk about today. In our current world, which is saturated with messages telling us to make ourselves the highest priority, to indulge and splurge on whatever we want, how can we live counterculturally and sacrificially serve others as Jesus commands? What does that look like? So we're going to turn to our key passage today. It's found in Philippians. So if you want to turn there, if you brought your Bibles, it's in the New Testament uh, towards the back. We're going to go to Philippians 2. We're going to focus on verses 1 through 5. And this is a letter that Paul wrote to the church um, in Philippi. Um, he was in prison when he wrote this letter. And there's so much joy in Philippians. He'd been through a lot of struggle, um, faced a lot of opposition with the church of Philippi. And yet when he thinks of them, he's filled with joy. So let's see what he says. Let's go to Philippians 2, um, and we'll start there. Therefore, if you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, if any comfort from his love, if any common sharing in the Spirit, if any tenderness and compassion— then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and of one mind. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves, not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of others. In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus. Now, that's our main scripture, but I have to keep going because this is how we know what Christ Jesus' mindset was, okay? So we're going to go through verses 6 through 11 right here. Have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who, being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on the cross. Therefore, God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father." the word of God. Would you bow your heads and pray with me as we open this morning? Dear Heavenly Father, God, uh, thank you for your word. Thank you for your example, God, of what it looks like to live a life surrendered to the Father, God, a life of humility. Thank you, Jesus, that um, God, I pray that we can see our own story reflected and lived out, Lord, the way that Jesus did, God, caring for others. Lord, help us learn today Help us be open to what you're teaching each of us, God. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 
Okay, so growing up with my mom and in my family, it was common to pick up people on the side of the road. Now, I know this sounds dangerous and strange, and I am not advocating that we go out and do this, but I'm just going to kind of explain what it was like growing up in my family with my mom. It goes something like this. We'd be on a, a family vacation, and we'd be driving. I remember driving through this kind of mountainous area, and there'd be, uh, there was a couple. It was a young couple. They seemed old to me, but I was little. So it was a young couple, and their bikes had a flat tire. Here's my mom. She rolls down the window. Flat tire? Oh, okay. Well, um, put your bikes in the back. Hop on in, and we're going to take you to a service station, which meant like hour, an hour of driving. I don't know how this young couple got out there. So here's my sister and I, my dad, and we're all just like in the car uh, with this couple going down the road. Or uh, we, we uh, grew up in Lafayette, up in the Bay Area, Northern California. So she would go up and down Moraga Road a lot. And there was this like bike path right next to the road. And she often picked up people on the path. It would, it would be like she would be driving and she'd see this older man like struggling with his groceries. And she'd be like, Is, I think that guy's going to our church. Girls, I'm turning around. We're picking him up. And all of a sudden, he's in between us with his groceries and we're taking him home. And this is just how it was. Um, I remember one time my mom um, was driving down the same road and she sees this man and she goes, oh, he missed his bus. He's trying to get to work. He missed his bus. And Elisa and I are like, what? And he, she turns around. Sure enough, this man had missed his bus and was trying to get to work. I, I kind of think this is a regular occurrence. I kind of remember her picking up this guy and taking him to work quite often. This is just, this is just how my mom was. Um, I also remember my mom uh, being in church. And I remember one time this lady walked in, and she, was, um, she, she walked in, and she had a smell uh, her hair was so messy and dirty, and just um, she was di disheveled and dirty, and nobody was sitting by her. I mean, it was just like, whoa, you know, she's just sitting there by herself. And after the service, you know, I kind of get up to get my things, and there's my mom right in her face, just looking right at her, telling her, I am so glad that you are here today. I hope you come back next week. This is where you need to be. My name's Sheila, the, ho the whole thing. Of course, that's, that's how my mom rolled. These are just a few examples. I've got tons of examples of how she did this, but I do want to highlight one um, that was really special to my heart. My mom, she would uh, walk down the beach promenade and she would adopt people, right? And it was just between her and God, she would adopt people, and not, not as a project, but as um, a person that she could pour her love and her hope into. So she did this all the time. So one time she was uh, walking down the beach, and she was like, Lord, who do you have for me? Who is it? And there was a man, and he was, it was Easter. He was holding a sign. It said, Happy Easter, with a smiley face. And she goes, oh, he's the one. So she goes over to him. She introduces herself. Um, my dad's with her this whole time, right? My dad's standing right there, like, where are we going? Okay, hi. So they meet this guy. His name's Tracy. Um, he was my mom's exact age. They liked the same music. They actually had a ton in common. We all got to know Tracy through my mom. I remember uh, the, being on the bike path and the kids, little, riding their bikes and being like, Tracy! And he's, he's down there, he's like waving to them, he knew them. Now they knew he maybe was without a home or maybe he lived down at the beach, but what they knew most importantly is that he was Grammar's friend. That's what they knew. Um, my mom would bring him chapstick, She'd bring him gloves. She would find out like who his favorite team was and bring him the hat with the logo on it. She did whatever she could every day. She was down there every day talking with him. Well, towards the end of his life, he got liver cancer. He'd been a big drinker in the past, but was, had been sober for many, many, many years. So at the end of his life, it was my mom who was taking him to his doctor's appointments. It was my mom sitting with him at the hospital. And my sister, Elisa, she wrote Tracy a whole letter about salvation and the gospel, and Tracy accepted the Lord. Um, and he died, and I know he's in heaven, and all of this because my mom reached out. And um, this exact weekend actually has been one year since my mom died of cancer. Um, and my mom, you know, she was fearless in how she served others. She was completely confident in Christ. She cared about the underdog, and she taught all of us to do that. She lived her life seeing others. She made it about others. 
She made sure that others felt good about themselves, that they had enough, that they were sitting in the best chair, that they had the best view, that they had space to tell their story, that they had the attention. She did all she could to include and invite. That was my mom, just humble and kind and listening to the promptings of the Spirit. So when I first got this topic uh, to speak on, I thought, oh gosh, you know, sacri- serving sacrificially in a world of self-care. I mean, talk about a first responder, what we just talked about with 9-11, but I thought, I don't, I don't think that I'm qualified to talk about this, right? Like, I'm not the first one signing up for the meal train, and I definitely have not helped the most people move on Saturdays. And, and I definitely am not a therapist, and I'm not an expert on self-care. And I started praying about this and thinking about this, and God brought understanding. And that's when I realized just how much I had learned from my mom. See, serving is a state of the heart, right? It's a state of the heart. And to serve people, you have to see people. So here's some questions that I want to ask ourselves. How well are we seeing and serving the people that can give us nothing in return? Are we, are we jumping up to open the door for the mom who's got, you know, two kids and a stroller and just can't quite get the door open to the coffee shop? Are we jumping up to help her? Do we notice the man struggling with his walker? Are we over there trying to help him and get to where he needs to go? Are we quick to let someone go in front of us in line at the grocery store? Do we take the time to see others, to be a light, to bring the kingdom of God that is in us to other people? Do we take time to actually pray with people? Here's a good one. Do we make space in our schedule to serve others? Is there any space? Is there any space to serve others? Are we asking God to show us, who who can I serve today? Who do you have for me? See, most of our relationships are transactional, right? Like we give to our friends and they give to us, or we give to our family, they give. It's, it's this kind of back and forth, like we love each other, we love each other well. It's transactional. transactional. However, what would it look like if we lived like Jesus, who was surrendered to his Father and moved to the Spirit, and his relationships were transformational, right? They were transforming. It wasn't about what other people could do for him. It was him. He was transforming their hearts. These are eternal interactions. So I want to go back really quick to our scripture. Um, I'm just going to read through a few of these lines. They're going to come up. It's going to say, if you have any encouragement from being united with Christ. And we can replace if right here with since. It's very close in the Greek. So since we have encouragement from being united with Christ. In other words, if Christ's love, if it inspires you, if it reassures you, if it gives you confidence and encourages you. That's what that's about. If any comfort from his love, right? Has his love given you comfort? Sometimes the biggest comfort that we can have in a situation is knowing that we're not alone, that God is with us. I have been there. That is the comfort of God. We know from Romans 8.38, right, that nothing can separate us from the love that God has for us. If any common sharing in the Spirit. In other words, we all have the same Holy Spirit. It it unites us. It unites us together, brings us into unity of purpose and grace. If any tenderness or compassion, right? When we are tender and we feel that compassion for other people, that's the Holy Spirit working in us. The Holy Spirit is always reminding us that God cares and that He loves. So we have all of these things. We have encouragement. We have comfort. We have common purpose in the Holy Spirit. We have tenderness. We have compassion. So, so what? What does Paul say? He says, Then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, and being of one spirit and one mind. Oh, and by the way, he throws this in. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. In humility, value others above yourselves, not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of others. And in your relationship with one another, have the same mindset as Jesus Christ. So that phrase, do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, that's a, that's a big one. I want to camp there for just a minute because ambition is powerful, right? Ambition is powerful. It motivates, to in, it motivates us to innovate and to dream big, and to work hard, and to do things that have never been done before. Ambition can even help us stay focused and live out our divine purpose. 
But the Word of God is warning us that selfish ambition and vain conceit is dangerous and will lead to our destruction. Christine Kane puts it this way. I love this quote. Selfish ambition, it seduces us into believing that our worth, our significance, and our security can somehow be found apart from God. Selfish ambition leaves us empty and hungry for more. It never delivers what it promises. Selfish ambition and vain conceit, right? It's all about self-focus, self-promotion, self-reliance, self-indulgence. And that's how our culture is enticing us more and more and more how to live, striving and unsatisfied. Uh, my sister Elise and I were talking about uh, this uh, passage over the weekend, and she was saying, you know, God, not you, should be the main character in your life story. I thought, oh, that's so good. Is God the main character of your life story, or are we, we the main character in our life story? Because that's how we were created, right? We were created to orbit around the Lord, right? It's like the sun and the planets. They're orbiting around. That's their center point. And that's our center point is the Lord. And when we don't have a center point and we're orbiting around ourselves, we start spiraling out of control because that's not how we were created. That is not God's design for us. We aren't created to orbit around ourselves. God knows this is destructive and dangerous. And guess who else knows it? Our enemy, right? He knows that. He would love nothing more than to keep us focused on ourselves and our problems and our deficiencies and our wants, even on our achievements. See, self-care and self-help, it starts with self and it ends with self. So I'm going to throw something out here. Instead of self-care... What if we lived, what if we focused on spirit care? Now, let me just explain this for a minute. Spirit care, what would that look like? Are we caring? Are we nurturing? Are we feeding the Holy Spirit inside of us the way that we are feeding and caring for ourselves? That Holy Spirit, what would that look like to continually feed the Holy Spirit inside of us? To spend time worshiping, to spend time in the Word of God, to be talking with him and communicating with him, to be resting in his goodness, right? We learn to hear him in these moments. Be still and know that I am God, Psalm 46.10. What if our focus every day was hearing from God and saying yes to whatever he said? Talk about living in adventure mode, right? Talk about living the abundant life. Because the way that God works, it's not going to be the way that we work. We are going to be on the ride of our lives. If we listen, we focus, we're asking intentionally, God, what do you want? What do you have for me today? What do you want me to do today? That's a surrender. That's open, right? That's, that's like God is creative. He is not trapped in a box. He's not trapped by time. He can do all things, right? We learn in, um, in Luke 1 through 37. When we really follow and surrender to the Lord, it's going to be the biggest adventure of your life. And if you're sitting here going, you know, I, uh, I don't get that. I don't hear from the Lord like that. I don't have that kind of relationship with God. I, I don't understand that. All you have to do is ask for it. That's what the Word says. Just ask me. Ask for a desire to be in God's Word. Ask for a hunger to know Him better. Get in here. He will reveal things to you that will blow your mind. He wants that communication with you. Just ask him. Don't go through life saying, yeah, that, you know, I, I just don't operate that way. Yes, you were designed. You were designed to operate that way. You were designed to hear from your, creative, your creator. And God's spirit is always going to lead us away from self. His spirit will actually transform us into selfless care. When we allow ourselves to be led by God, he will always, always lead us to love others. And when we live our lives to please God above all else, that is our best yes. It's a humble way of living. It's a surrendered way of living. It's the way that we see Jesus living with his Father. So I'm going to close with this story. Um, a few years ago, when our house burned down in the Thomas Fire, um, and we lost everything we owned, right? We lost our car, we lost our home, we had no furniture, we had no clothes, we had no picture. It's, it's just like, okay, you have nothing. That's, that's where I, I, I was at this point. And I went to this function, and everybody there spoke Spanish. Everybody spoke Spanish, and I was like, okay, how am I going to have a deep conversation? I'm not sure I'm 
So I, I sit down, and I sit next to this, happen to sit next to this girl. Uh, she was young. Uh, she was a sophomore at the time at Oxnard High School. And so she sits down by me, and, and we start talking because she can speak English. Her parents are there. They're speaking Spanish, and, and I'm sitting there talking to really just her. And we have this really great conversation, and she starts talking to me about young life. And she's really involved in Young Life Oxnard, and she's, she's talking about it, and she tells me with these bright eyes, I just saw this video about camp. I saw this video, and, and it's about summer camp, and I was like, oh, you know, I was talking to her about, oh, my kids, you, you should go to that. You should go to camp if you can. She's all, oh, yeah, I, I won't be able to go to camp. Um, I, I help my parents. We pick in the fields. From May to October, she told me, she picks in the fields with her parents. So she does school, goes and picks in the field all summer long, all day long. That's what she does. And I was, I was, felt like the Lord just told me, like, send her to summer camp. Now, I heard it. It was, it was this quiet nudge, but it was very firm. And I started to think to myself, wait, okay, I just met this girl. Like, my kids don't even have shoes. Like, is that smart? Is that, is that what I should be doing? And I heard myself confidently say, I'm going to send you to summer camp. And she was like, what? I'm, I'm going to send you to summer camp. And she was so excited and so overjoyed. Um, the next day, I came to work. I called Alex, Oxnard um, Gung Life. I'm like, you know, I want to send her to summer camp. He knew her. Oh, she's great. That'd be great. You know, and I said, how much does it cost? He said, $525. And I was like, whoa, that seemed like a lot to me. And I was like, okay, 500, okay. Wrote the check, mailed it off. You know, the, the desire to make sure that I was following God was stronger than my fear at that point. I was like, if God told me I'm going to do this, and I'm pretty sure that that's what he told me. So a few months passed. I didn't really think anything of it. I'm actually still in communication with her. She's like a sophomore at VC. She's, it's, it's kind of this amazing um, story. But a few months after this initial incident, I uh, go into my mailbox here at work, and there's an envelope for me, and I open it, and it's like anonymous, $500. And I was like, what? Like, when does this happen? What is this? I go, oh my gosh, Lord, thank you. Like, I tied it to this, you know, like, wow, it's so amazing. Look at what God does. Well, it didn't stop. So I got another $500 check. And John got one, and Drew got one, and Sienna got one, and it was somebody in this church. I was just like, what is happening? And God was showing me, Marcy, you will never outgive me. When you listen to me, when you serve the way I'm calling, I'm going to show you my abundance. I'm going to show you so you know it. And I, I, I knew it's from the Lord. I knew it was tied to this. And I was just, I've just been blown away. And that, that's how God works. Right? He asks us to step out in faith and to trust him and to serve others. And this is what he does all the time. Not only was he blessing me and the faith that I had, him that, had for him that day, he was using somebody else. He was speaking to somebody else. I don't even know what is happening. Like they're writing checks and he's using them um, in our lives. God just continually is reminding us that we can't ever come close to outserving him or outgiving him. He is a generous, faithful God. You know, uh, the scripture that this reminds me of is found in Matthew 6, 33. And um, the band's going to come up soon. This, this scripture, Matthew 6, 33, says, Seek me first, the kingdom of God and my righteousness, right? And I think sometimes in this world, oh, it says, seek me first, the kingdom of God and my righteousness, and all these things will be added unto you. And I feel like in our world right now, we're chasing after the added unto you part. Like we want the added unto you. We want this, we want our achievements, but it says, no, seek me first. God takes care of all the added unto you. He promises to take care of you. We don't have to focus on that part. We focus on the Lord and his righteousness, and he will give you everything that you need to live the life that he's calling you to live. So I'm going to have us stand up um, as I pray us out, as I pray over today, and we go into a time of worship. And I just want to remind you that God's yoke is lighter. His way is better. We need to love God and love people. 
And when we say yes to God, it is always the best yes. Let's pray. God, dear Heavenly Father, Lord, thank you for this morning. Thank you for the way that you, that our stories intersect with yours, Lord, that your spirit is alive and well within us. God, I pray that we would nurture your spirit, God, that you would speak to us, that you would show us, God, that you would give us opportunities and space to love others. God, I know when we follow your spirit, Lord, you make a way. You make a way to get everything else to line up. Sometimes you even make our schedules lighter. If you call us to serve, if you call us to step into someone's life and pray and help or respond, you are there, you are faithful. Thank you, God, that we don't have to spin around ourselves and figure out things for ourselves and try to accumulate and acquire. God, thank you that you're so much bigger than we are, that your plan and your story, your redemptive story is so much bigger than us. Thank you that we get to be a part of it. Lord, help us and show us how to partner with you as we walk in this world, as we love you with all of our hearts, minds, and souls, and strength, and as we love other people, God. You are so good. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.